Hi, and welcome to this week's Ask Brian question from our newsletter. Last week I got a question about the distinction between biological significance and statistical significance. This question comes up a lot, and it's taught in every single introductory statistics class. So, the question goes something like this. If you've rejected a null hypothesis, so say you're testing for whether or not some effect is zero, the question is whether or not the effect that you've estimated is really just statistically significant, uh, or if the actual magnitude of the effect uh, represents something that's biologically meaningful. And this is, uh, so I'll talk about where this comment is coming from, but then I'll talk about how it's maybe a little bit more complicated of a problem than simply repeating the statement, biological st significance isn't just st statistical significance. It's a mouthful. Okay, so let me talk about where this comes from, and I'm going to do a little bit of writing. Very, very basic equations. So first there's the concept of the type 1 error rate and the power. So remember, when you get a statistically significant result, there's always the possibility that it's a type 1 error. You errantly rejected the null hypothesis. However, you've controlled that probability to be low, usually something like 5%. So you're willing to tolerate the possibility, the 5% chance that your procedure will produce a type 1 error. So okay, so let's put that aside. Now let's talk about rejecting when the alternative is true. That's the probability of that occurring is power, right? We want more power. We want to be able to reject the null hypothesis when the alternative is true, when, okay? So let's just imagine we're looking at, say, a hyper antihypertensive treatment. Um, we have a treated group and a non-treated group. We're looking at blood pressure, and we just want to test whether or not the blood, there's a difference in blood pressure between the treated group and the untreated group. We get a significant result. Let's assume everything's normally distributed, same sample size in each group and a common variance, all these other assumptions. So that test then really depends on only one quantity, and I'm going to write it down. So it depends on the mean, the difference in the means between the two groups, it depends on that common standard deviation between the two groups, and it depends on the sample size, the within group sample size. And there's some other factors, there's a square root two that people might quibble over whether or not I'm, I'm putting in there, or I'm omitting. Um, but this quantity really determines the power. So you're going to get more power as the means get further apart. As this number gets bigger in absolute value, you're going to have more power. Okay, so let's assume mu1 is bigger than mu2. So as this gets bigger, you're going to have more power. As the variance gets smaller, you're going to have more power. Okay, and then as n gets large, you're going to have more power. So this is kind of where the statement comes from, is you can have a small mu1 minus mu2, right, or even a small relative effect size, right, the difference in the means in standard deviation units, that can be small in a sense of not being biologically significant, yet if you have a large enough n, you will still reject. You'll still have a lot of power for actually rejecting. So people would say because the actual mu1 minus mu2 um, or the actual mu1 minus mu2 over sigma, because those things are small, um, even though you rejected, maybe you're rejecting for something that isn't actually of practical importance. Okay, um, so that's where that, that's a lot of where that, that statement comes from. Um, but there's several points of discussion. The first is how do you combat this? Well, there's, an, there's one easy solution, which is don't just perform hypothesis tests, actually create confidence intervals too. So when you calculate the difference in the sample means, x bar 1 minus x bar 2, uh, you know, plus or minus, you know, two standard errors of the sample mean, right, then you get a confidence interval. You can actually assess in the units of the problem right, how big the mean is, and it, that'll also tell you whether you reject on the test, because whether or not the interval contains zero will tell you whether or not you reject or not. Okay, so uh, one strategy for combating this is to look at confidence intervals. Um, but then I want to uh, I, I talk about the, the fact that, um, you know, this distinction is in everything. Okay, so take as an example a lot of epidemiological studies, okay? Um, they're constantly reporting very small effect sizes, even though they have very large ends. So does that mean the entire field of kind of large sample observational epi is just wasting their time with things that are statistically significant but not biologically significant? And I think they would, they would say no when these significant results come out, come out. And they would say things like, well, um, we don't know what the true model is. Right? So in this case, we assumed we had the correct model. So they might have adjusted for a lot of other variables in the process of running their regression model. 
And when they do that, they're saying, well, I've kind of over adjusted. And by doing that, I'll have chipped away at my effect size to the point where, you know, all I care about is whether or not from this extremely conservative model that I've put forward that adjusts for everything possible, that it's still significant is what's important. The actual size isn't, isn't as important because I've scrutinized it to such a large degree with so many confounders that I've potentially tried to adjust for. So that's an example of an argument someone would use that would say, even though my estimated effect is quite small, the statistical significance is still important. And we haven't talked about other ways in which the model could not be true. There might be biases in these other things that would impact how you interpret statistical significance in a particular problem relative to the effect size that you actually observe. So this having been said, it basically goes to the point that you can't just turn on hypothesis testing and turn off your brain and just say, my test is significant, ergo it's meaningful. Um, that, uh, that's simply not true. There's, there's a couple of terms and they have very different meanings. Whether or not something st is statistically significant has a, has a meaning. Whether it's biologically significant has a meaning. Whether or not it's meaningful is, is, is another term that, that's dependent on, 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 on the context, right? Whether or not it's predictive. So as an example, um, uh, uh, we might give a, a antihypertensive treatment that has a very small effect, but a real effect, if we give it in a clinical trial, it might lower people's blood pressure. However, if we actually want to predict who has low blood pressure, whether or not they're taking this treatment because it has such a small effect, wouldn't be a very useful predictor. Other things like your diet, your age, your weight, other factors might be give us a better ability to actually predict your um, blood pressure so that if we were building up a prediction model, this whether or not you're taking this medication would probably not be worth the reduction in prediction error that it costs because of the other consequences of throwing in uh, extra regressors. So um, that's just to point out the fact that predictability is a different thing from statistical significance as well. Um, uh, the other, you know, and, and just because something is, is, is a good predictor also doesn't mean it's meaningful. Meaningful was another term I used earlier. So take, for example, stock price. Probably the best predictor of a stock price was its stock price two seconds ago, right? But that's not a meaningful predictor. It's highly predictive, but it's not a meaningful predictor, right? Like you can't operationalize that prediction so the, to the point of someone either studying why stocks go up or down or to someone who's actually trying to invest but but doesn't have the opportunity to buy stocks every second, right? That extra information isn't useful at all. Okay, so hopefully what I've done is made the problem a lot more confusing. Um, but I think the basic point I'm trying to make is, yes, of course, there is a distinction between biological significance and statistical significance. However, um, the relationship is a little bit more complicated than we usually give credence to in our introductory statistics classes and that there is no substitute for interpreting your results in the context of the problem, fully considering whether or not your modeling assumptions are accurate, thinking about the potential biases that might have occurred in the way in which you perform the sampling, uh, thinking about confounders and other things that you put in the model. Jumbling all of this together in your interpretation is what's necessary to actually assess the importance of a statistical test. Okay, so hopefully this helped um, and didn't make things that much more confusing, um, and I look forward to seeing you next week.